good to see everyone this morning. I heard a doctor say, if you sneeze one time and that's it, you might have a cold. If you sneeze two or three times, it's probably allergies. And during this state and age, when someone sneezes, no matter where you're at, you all look around. And step three steps back, so. You know what, in everything that we've got going on, we're still thankful that we can come together to worship our Heavenly Father. And that's, that is, as our children, as His children, that is what we do. And we really appreciate and thank Him for this opportunity. Let's go ahead and open our Bibles, if you would. We're going to talk this morning about something that seems incredibly somewhat challenging during this day and age because of the various um, restrictions that we're having to abide by. But that's the idea of singing praises into our Heavenly Father, singing praises. Now, I do want to kind of, I hadn't thought about this for the sermon, but it came to me just a moment ago, so we're going to throw it out there. When we talk about singing here in just a moment, keep in mind, we're not talking about professional singers. We're not talking about singing for enjoyment, singing for performance. Most people, if you have had some sort of choir, some sort of vocal teaching, you're going to be taught to sing in a particular way, especially when you're trying to project and perform and entertain others. But what we find throughout the history of the Bible is that God's people have always sung praises to Him. Now, it's possible that when you look at temple worship, that the priests, there were those who were considered singers. And so it's very likely they may have gone through some chain training for that, if you would. But in general, though, the instances of singing that we see within the Scriptures seem to be spontaneous. Individuals who, for that moment, they're going to praise God because of what He has done. Now, for instance, Exodus 15, verses 1 through 19, Moses and the Israelites, they sing praises to God for His deliverance. And then Miriam... She sang a praise unto God in Exodus chapter 15, verses 20 and 21. And then you come on down, Deborah and Barak in Judges 5, verses 1 through 31. And Hezekiah, coming forward into the history of the children of Israel. Hezekiah, one of the, 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 the latter faithful kings of Judah. He said, sing praise to the Lord with the words of David and Asaph the seer. And so when you sit down and you study the scriptures, you find that the idea of singing praises unto God is nothing new. Matter of fact, Paul and Silas, when they were in prison, what did they do? They sang praises to God, and they prayed to God. So whether we're talking about temple worship, or we're talking about a song of victory, or we're talking about sitting in prison... Followers of God have always used singing as a means of conveying their gratitude, their, their thanksgiving, their praise, and their adoration. It's always been a part of the way that His people would express their worship to Him. And as I said at the start, and the point that I was trying to make is, is the difference between training, you know, for vocal training and so forth, but from the start... They didn't simply sing to sing. It wasn't, well, these people just like singing, so they, they found inspiration and decided to sing. No. They didn't sing to perform. You know, they, when, when you read about Miriam and you read about the others, you know, I doubt very seriously that when they were done, Miriam said, how did I do? They didn't clap, but they're not supposed to. How did I do? I doubt very seriously it was anything such as that. And then the last one there, they sang to praise God. And in our day and age of performances, um, I, I really would suspect that maybe in our culture over the last two, three hundred years, we probably have more performances going on, both live and, and recorded, than has been in any previous time in history. And so there is a tendency there for individuals to, to bring this level of, of, of performance that we have embraced within our society into the worship service. It's not about that. It's singularly about praising our Heavenly Father and then the benefits that we reap from that as Christians. 
So the first thing I'd like for us to consider, knowing that God's people have always sang praises, is we need to look to see where the songs are to come from. Where do they originate from when we, when we praise our Heavenly Father? And of course, the answer to the question is from our heart. True worshiping of the Lord must be done from the heart, and then it flows outwardly. When Jesus told the woman at the well that the time would come when the Father would seek those who would worship him in spirit and in truth, this is the idea. If we begin our worship from within our heart, then what flows outward in the outward things that we see and we do will be proper before the Lord. A statement I've made a couple times recently, and I'm going to make it a lot more because I think it really hits home. There is a singular phrase that can cause delight within a person and fear in the person sitting next to him. And that phrase is real simple. God knows your heart. Okay. So God knows my heart. If I'm striving to faithfully follow him, then that should be a good thing. He knows my heart. But if I'm not striving to follow him, then that's a bad thing, because he knows my heart. But this reality should remind us of the importance of making certain that we offer up a worship that he finds acceptable, beginning from the heart. Notice here in 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. David, or more Samuel, when he goes about to pick the next king, notice the statement that is made there. For the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance. But the Lord looks at the heart. That's why he chose David over David's others, other siblings. Because the Lord looked to the heart. And that's how he makes his, made his judgment there in selecting David. And, and we could set aside this topic for a moment and pursue another topic if we wanted to. But think about this. If the Lord looked at young David and chose him to be the next king because the Lord looks at the heart and David had all the problems he had, then what does it say about us? We can still serve the Lord from our heart. Even though we're not perfect, even though we may have issues and failings, we can still worship him from the heart. Turn with me, if you would, to Psalms 34, verse 18. Let's look at a couple of passages here regarding our heart and the Lord looking within our heart. The first one in Psalms chapter 34, and note with me there in verse 18. There we go. The psalmist writes the following. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as has a contrite spirit. Setting aside pride, embrace humility. Setting aside a selfish desire, we now take on selflessness to serve our Heavenly Father. When a heart is broken, he is near to us. The idea of a broken heart here isn't like love and someone breaking up with you. It is the idea of submitting unto the Lord. It is the idea they're no longer being prideful. Like David in Psalms 51 will be very similar to that. When he realized what he had done, his heart was broken before the Lord. A contrite heart is what he offered up. And this is what the Lord found acceptable because this is where the Lord looked. Turn over to Psalms 51. This is a, the psalm, it's typically accepted that David wrote this psalm as, as repentance or expressing his repentance for his sin with Bathsheba. And in Psalms 51 there in verse 10, David writes, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Notice there, create in me a clean heart, he says. Then we jump over to Hebrews chapter 10. Note with me there in verse 22. The Hebrew writer, or the writer of the Hebrew letter here, notice what he says in chapter 10 there in verse 32. Um, 22, there we go. He says, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. What enables us to draw near unto the Lord in full assurance of faith with a true heart? Well, it's the forgiveness of our sins. It's the reconciliation. It is the sanctification. Um, and that's what he's talking about there when he mentions the heart sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And then lastly, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, 
let's consider one more passage that really drives home the point of the importance of our heart being right with God in our worship of Him and in our daily lives of serving Him. Matthew chapter 5, there in verse 8, Jesus says the following. He says, blessed are the, notice what he says, the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So, with that being said and that being understood, we understand that if we're going to worship the Lord, our worship must come from a heart that is clean, a heart that is pure, a heart that is holy, that is sanctified, that is set apart. And if such is the case, what will happen when we worship our Heavenly Fathers, we will mean what we say. We will believe what we say, and we will also practice what we say. Think about that for a moment. If it is a worship that comes from the heart, then anything, the songs that we sing, the words within the songs, the prayers that we pray, everything will mean it. And it will be as we live. And if we're not living that way, then the worship will serve as a time of correction. And we will correct and change our lives. But now let's talk about, though, the idea of worshiping God in song. Because that's kind of the topic that we're dealing with today. Worshiping God in song. It must begin with the heart. When we sit down and we have the song books, we have the songs written by men, and we choose songs that are scriptural to make certain that in our praise of God, it is proper within His sight. When we choose those songs and we are singing those songs, or from the Psalms, you can take any of the Psalms and use them in worship of God. When we are singing through the words, it must be that our minds are centered upon what we are singing so that He hears from our heart those songs. How many times have you ever been in a car with someone, you're listening to the radio, and, and, and you say, you know, that, the, the, the words of that song are powerful, you know. And um, you, the person says that, and you think, well, I've never really listened to the words of Eye of the Tiger, but I guess it is pretty powerful, maybe. But the point is, someone took a moment to listen to the words of the song. And they said, they're real moving. They, they, you know, they, they really, they, they really mo motivate you to do something. I don't know. We need to pay as much attention to those words that we are singing in the song. Um, it's easy sometimes to get caught up in the, the, the rules of the melodic structure of the song. But that's not what's most important. When God listens to what we offer up unto Him when it comes to songs, Ephesians 5.19 tells us that we are to sing and make melody in our hearts to the Lord. Okay? So that's why if you are tone deaf, you can still sing a beautiful song of praise that the Lord hears beautifully. Okay? And if the best you can do is mumble the words of the song, as long as your heart is praising the Lord, then that's good. That's where the praise comes from. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Colossians 3.16, somewhat of a parallel passage written by Paul. He writes, singing with grace or thankfulness, some translations will render it as, singing with grace or thankfulness in your hearts to the Lord. Now, I do know sometimes that life doesn't always go very easily for us. And things may fall apart five minutes before you get to the building. And, and even if you don't have kids and you're just a couple, that can still happen. For just a moment, you brought up the wrong idea, the wrong discussion, five minutes before you got here. So you get out of the car, and your mind is all jumbled up, and, and your emotions are very on edge, and, and you're very upset. That's why they say when you come in, leave it at the door if at all possible. And that was something I heard preachers say. When you come in, leave your problems at the door. When you leave, if they're still there, get them on your way out. But you may find that oftentimes that someone else took them. They're not there anymore. But the point is, we have to do our best to clear our minds as much as we can so that when we worship God, the melody that we make from our hearts is pleasing unto Him. He knows the worry of our hearts. He knows the thoughts of our mind. And sometimes the songs of, of gratitude, the songs of thankfulness, there's even songs that we sing that would express our worries and concerns to God. That's okay. That's fine. Because it's the melody that we make within our hearts, it's the thoughts that goes through our minds, the petitions and the praises that we offer to Him, that is what He hears. 
Now, there are several examples in the New Testament, of, in the New Testament specifically now, of individuals who would praise God in songs. One of the first examples you find when you look at the New Testament is Jesus and his apostles. Now, think about that for a moment. Jesus, think about his oneness with God. John 17, he talks about that. And so, of all people who had, I'm going to say direct connection, it really is not the best way of terming it, of saying it, but if there was going to be anyone who really didn't have to sing praises because he was praising God himself and he was receiving praise, you know. Father talks about glorifying him as you glorify me and all that. But Jesus prayed to his father, didn't he? He studied the law, he knew the law, and he sang praises to his father. And so notice here in Matthew, let's look at these two verses there. My point is the lesson that we're learning from this is that just as Jesus and his apostles saw the importance of singing praises to God, so too do we. Look there in verse 30 of Matthew chapter 26. When they were done with the, 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 uh, the Passover feast, where the Lord's Supper was instituted there, he says in verse 30, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount Olives. Now sometimes when we talk about singing, we kind of think about it in this fashion here. We come together to sing praises unto God. And when you study the scriptures, there's really only one passage. Wait, when you think about Ephesians um, 5, 19, Colossians 3, 16, these passages lean in this direction of congregational worship. But there's really only one passage that really talks about singing in a collection, in a, in a gathering as we have here. And that's 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And there are several miraculous things done there in the worship service. But he says, if anyone sings with the Spirit, let him sing with the understandings. The idea of singing there, done collectively. But most of the other verses are examples of people singing outside of what we would call a collective assembly. This is one of them. This matter of fact, this was even before the church was established. Turn over to Mark chapter 14, verse 26, very similarly. Mark chapter 14, there in verse 26, we see very clearly that when they were done, what did they do? Well, according to the text here, he says there in verse 26 there, that when they had sung a hymn, what did they do? They went out to the Mount of Olives. We already talked about Paul and Silas earlier. They were in prison there in Philippi, and they sang praises unto God. The Gentiles, Romans chapter 15, here's a direct reference to the Gentiles singing praises and worship, or singing songs of praise and worship to our Heavenly Father. Notice they're beginning in Romans chapter 15, and let's pick up there in verse 8. Romans 15 there in verse 8, Now I say that Jesus Christ has become a servant to the circumcision of the, for the truth of God to confirm the promise made to the fathers and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, for this reason I will confess to you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And read a little farther with me. And again he says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Laud him, all you peoples. And again Isaiah says, there shall be a root of Jesse, and he who shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him the Gentiles shall hope. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in the believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So it is God's intention that as Christians, as his children, we praise him. Whether it's in the privacy of our own home or we have gathered together with saints, it is how we express with our lips the fruit that we are offering unto him. The Hebrew writer, turn over there, makes a very interesting statement along this, these lines. He refers to the fruit of their lips. And if you'll start there in Hebrews chapter 13, we could go back up earlier in the context. It's a beautiful text talking about what Christ has done for us and, and what we have now that we are in Christ Jesus. But he says in verse 13, Therefore let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. Therefore by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Now I like the idea there, let us continually offer 
the sacrifice of praise to God, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. And that could be done verbally and through a spoken message, or it could be done in song, as we have seen throughout the course of the scriptures. And so when we talk about worshiping God in song, we understand that probably the primary reason we do so is to praise him. It's not to entertain ourselves, but it's to praise our Heavenly Father. Now, there is a secondary benefit that we gain from this. Notice in Paul's writing again, he says, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So there is time when, as brethren, we need this mutual encouragement. We need this mutual edification. And the way that we do this is we speak to one another, Colossians 3, verse 16 uses the term teaching and admonishing one another. So when we talk about the songs that we sing, not only should they praise God, but there's a learning method to the song. There is the way that we are encouraged. Um, if I would say take your songbooks and open them up, but then we'd have to wipe them all down, so don't do that. But I'll do this one. No one will touch it for seven days. But like, for instance, if we wanted a song of encouragement, a song of admonition, I surrender all. A song there that talks about our love for the Lord and our willingness to surrender our life unto Him. Or 438, we walk by faith and not by sight. Just so many songs in here that we sing that if we will listen to the words are designed to teach us, are designed to admonish us, are designed to help us to be stronger in our faith unto God. The idea of singing praises to God is very simple. The reason why we don't use instrumental music, by the way, is that they didn't do it in the first century. And what Paul focuses on is very important. We make melody with our hearts. We make melody in our hearts. We sing with thanksgiving unto God from our heart. And so there's no distraction. There's no disturbances. Someone starts the song, and we all sing together. It doesn't matter if we're on pitch. I mean, it helps the ear, but it doesn't matter. It's important that we sing together, that it's done decently and in orderly. We can bring that in from 1 Corinthians 15. But what is important, and I guess there are two things, especially when we are with others. The first one is that God hears our hearts. That's most important. And two, we hear one another. That's also important as well. Um, we need to be able to hear when we're with others because we receive the benefits from that exposure. Not just because we are singing the words ourselves, but because you are singing the words and I'm hearing them from you also. So when everything is said and done, it's a very simple lesson. We need to remember that our worship to God, our worship, if it is to be acceptable unto God, must proceed from our heart. It must begin there, and then let everything else that we do in relation to worship flow outwardly and accordingly. And remember that our worship in songs, what we see there within the scriptures, that our worship in songs must originate from the heart. We think about the words that we say, we mean the words that we say, we focus on the words that we say. This is how we worship God in song. There's a lot more that we could say on it, but it's very simple. A very simple reminder of where our hearts and our minds need to be when we come together to worship Him and we sing songs of praises, or even if I'm going to sing a song of praise at home. Our hearts and minds need to be there for that purpose, for the Lord to hear that. If you're not a Christian, you need to become one. Jesus died upon the cross of Calvary so that you could receive the remission of your sins. He paid the price so that the sin which separates you from God could be removed and the guilt be washed away by the, the blood of Christ that was sacrificed on the cross of Calvary. He has paid the price for your redemption. You were in bondage unto sin. Now the price has been paid so that you can be set free. If you make the decision to do that, if you believe that Christ is the Son of God, you believe enough to, to walk away from your life of sin and turn to a life of serving Him, then you can do that this morning. Obey His command to be baptized. So you rise up then 
Paul says to walk in the newness of life. Paul was also told, arise and be baptized, or Peter told the folks, arise and be baptized, washing away your sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. You need to make that decision. That's what Paul was told. Sorry, I got my brain crossed up there with um, Ananias there in, in, in Acts chapter 22. He was told to, what he said that he was asked, why do you wait? Arise and be baptized, washing away your sins calling upon the name of the Lord. You can do that this morning if you're ready. If you are a Christian, you've not been living faithfully, why not? It's time to repent and let's come back and, and let's sing together in fellowship the songs of praises unto God. So together with one heart and one mind, as one body of Christ, we praise our Heavenly Father. If you're accepted to the Gospels, call an invitation. Come forward now as we stand and as we sing.